Hi, everybody. Welcome to week eight of our English 3180 online course. Man, we are over the halfway mark. So that means we want to look to the future and finish strong. You guys are doing an awesome job. I'm really excited, especially to dive into your brainstorming projects that you were working on last week. It was really fun to talk to all of you who made appointments with me via Zoom. Please know that I'm still available for those. So if you want to chat about the course or if you have questions as you continue on your secondary research journey, that's totally fine. Just send it to me. Send me an email and then we will set up a Zoom appointment. Speaking of uh, your projects, I kind of got distracted there for a minute because I was thinking... Just remember that whatever it was you brainstormed that you thought, yeah, I think this one or this one will be the one, you could actually start looking up some secondary sources for both or all three or just one at whatever the case may be. Like if you're solid on your project idea, you can start doing your research. If you're not solid on your project idea, still start doing a little bit of reading so that you can get a sense for what's out there already. And that will help to direct your vision as we continue on in the semester. Okay, so in this week's video, I have just a brief overview of our week's activities, which should feel rather familiar, especially as we're kind of jumping back into them uh, after taking last week to work on our midterm projects. And then I've got a lot to talk to you guys about. I have a whopper of a PowerPoint, and I just want to quickly hit some of the high points from this week's readings. There's a lot of overlap and kind of like symbiosis in this week's readings, and I can't wait to talk to you about it. So I'm going to switch over to my Canvas view, and we'll get right to it. Okay. So one of the things you'll notice is that we have a lot of readings here this week, but if you were paying attention to my announcement at the beginning of the week, thankfully, some of it's optional and some of it's not needed. So the piece from Augustine on Christian doctrine, you do not need to read all 170 pages of that, just book four. So that's about, oh, I think it's probably like 27 pages, give or take. That's a lot more doable, hopefully. <laughs> the Three Arabic Treatises on Aristotle's Rhetoric by Al-Farabi is also similarly article length. The Julian Norwich piece, The Revelation of Divine Love, is even shorter. But just remember, when you this will link you out to like a Gutenberg Project style document and a good half of it you have to scroll through because the first half of all that text is the intro which you're welcome to read if you're interested in this particular piece and the history and all of that stuff but if you just want to get to the revelations of divine love itself that comes oh like you gotta scroll and scroll and scroll and then you'll see the title and then you'll get into it then we have Two articles, only two that are required. So I'm asking you to read The Borrowman and The Chandler. And then if you are super intrigued by Julian of Norwich or if you're intrigued by a feminist revisioning of historicity around rhetoric in general, you might want to read this optional second article on Julian of Norwich. But other than that, we just have these two articles, these two, three primary texts, um, none of which hopefully are as long as they seemed at first blush. Uh, your chat check-in prompt will be at the end of this video. Reading response number seven and reading discussion seven will be due on Sunday. Okay, so I'm gonna head out into my PowerPoint and we will get on with the mini lesson. So we're talking about medieval rhetoric. And we start with one of the heavy hitters, a name that is likely familiar to most of us, Augustine. Um, he's a pretty famous medieval Christian theologian. And um, the part of his writing that we're focusing on doesn't deal as much with straight up theology or scriptural interpretation as much as it does with 
a rhetorical presentation of information. Um, so focusing on book four of On Christian Doctrine allows us to get that bit of his writings in there. But there's a lot of interesting stuff about Augustine that I didn't even have room to put on this slide. Stuff like, you know, when he was in Carthage, he was making money teaching lawyers rhetorical strategies, right? So he was kind of, that sounds familiar. He was using some of those sophistry skills to make his money before he moved home. And uh, he doesn't like the feeling that he got when he was doing that kind of work. He calls himself a salesman of tricks. And I think that that's a really interesting just point in the discussion that we've been having since the beginning of the semester about what does it mean to be a sophist? Is, is it good? Is it bad? Is it pragmatic? Is it cutthroat? And, you know, kind of the answer is, well, it depends and it sounds like from Augustine's own writings that he was not the good kind of sophist when he was making his money in that realm. Um, but he is very interested in what that background led him to think about, which is a lot of the philosophical writings on truth. What is truth and what is chance and how are they related and this comes into play when he starts talking about his rhetorical strategies because he's going to set up a sort of uh, logical flow for us. And in the books that I didn't have you guys write, he's talking about understanding scripture. So like how to read it, how to study it, how to get at truth, so to speak. And then he's going to talk about, in this book, articulating that, articulating the scriptures, preaching, really. Um, and he focuses here on presenting the scriptural knowledge both with elegance, elegance, eloquence is what I actually wrote on my slide, but they both, they both hang true, right? Elegance, eloquence, same, same, or similar in speaking. But he also talks about how it's important to have clarity when presenting ideas. And interestingly, he says, if you got to choose between the, tr between the two, be clear. That's kind of interesting. And he elaborates this with different styles of speaking, which if it feels Aristotelian in how he's breaking things down categorically, that's probably not a mistake since that's where his educational roots are. But he talks about restrained speech, moderate speech, and grand speech, and that one should use these at appropriate times depending on what you're doing with your content and depending on what your audience needs to hear. Or, you know, like, are they getting bored? Then you should use a grand style. Uh, you should use a moderate style if they seem fairly calm, but you want to entertain them. But I think it's interesting that towards the end of this piece, he kind of gives us a basis for understanding where he's coming from in terms of ethos. So Augustine is a big believer in ethos as a huge uh, reason to believe or not believe a specific speaker, right? And this is where we get this idea of practicing what you preach. Because he says, if you're going to say something, especially if you're going to claim that it's truth from the scripture, you should actually practice it. So, some high points on Augustine. Next, we're going to move on to Al-Farabi and his commentary on Aristotle. So, this is uh, a little bit later in history from Augustine, but it still is one of the leading commentaries on Aristotle. So, Al-Farabi is primarily interested in demonstrating unity in philosophy across multiple times, locations, cultures. Um, and I think that this is a very interesting idea that uh, is prescient to what we're trying to do in this class. Most of all, he wants to sort of try to reconcile Plato and Aristotle's ideas and he is really fascinated with the Aristotelian concept of logic. And Al-Farabi is going to argue that categories are a first step in logic. 
So more on this in a minute, but we get to our third primary text, which is the Julian of Norwich, Divine Revelations of Love. This comes in the late part of the Middle Ages. So this is much later in the time span. But I think it's fascinating that, first of all, this is the first book in the English language written by a woman. So that's kind of cool. There's also two different versions. There's a short text that Julian of Norwich wrote immediately following the illness that, that precipitated this vision. And then she expands on it about 20 years later in the long text, which is the version that I'm having you guys read. Um, she was an anchoress, which means it's like a fancy word for hermit. Um, and it like her name isn't even Julian, which is fascinating to me as well. That's sort of like a um, humble moniker that she took on reflective of the church where she was an anchoress. But she does something very interesting in her writing, and it's worth noting in terms of rhetorical history, that she's laying out her revelations in a linear fashion, but she is, it's deceptively simple. She's taking on some really difficult theological arguments as she moves down the revelations and presenting some really original theological ideas in a very matter-of-fact way. So, when we think about our secondary sources, looking at Barrowman, we are introduced not just to Al-Farabi, but to some other prominent Arabic scholars. And he is centering these scholars as a really important building block. I think of the quote, standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So Barrowman's arguing here that the reason that Western European thought is so well positioned to take up ancient Greek philosophy is because of the Arabic scholars in what is now Spain. So this is so cool and so fascinating to think about what's happening at different periods in history and which cultures have more or less developed scholarly cultures embedded in them. Um, and the Arabic cultures of this time were phenomenally more advanced than the other Western European cultures. So he's going to introduce us really in a deep dive way to Ibn Rushd, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I might not be, but I love his nickname, which is The Commentator. And he's going to compare Rushd to Boethius, who's commonly thought of as a prominent or maybe the prominent commentator of Aristotle. <clears throat> and he says, well, actually, Rashad was doing the same thing and actually completed what Boethius did not even complete, which was to commentate on every single one of Aristotle's writings. So how do you like them apples? And Barrowman's also going to compare Rashad to Thomas Aquinas. And I, I bet you dollars to donuts and I know this was true for me when I started studying this, I had heard of Boethius and I had heard of Thomas Aquinas, but I had never heard of Ibn Rushd. And that's something that, once again, we're trying to challenge ourselves with this semester, seeing that here's a scholar who is doing the same things as these other scholars that we have heard about, and yet we haven't heard about him. Overall, though, one of the things that just just tickles me pink about this piece is that Barrowman is really highlighting the scholarly prowess of the Andalusian um, writers and thinkers and how uh, secure of a scholarly environment they were writing in to be able to make some of the critiques that they are making without fear of reprisal from any government or any religious body. That's pretty cool. Okay, then we're going to talk about Chandler. Last one. Chandler is going to be comparing and contrasting Augustine and Julian of Norwich, specifically looking at the divine revelations of love through an Augustinian lens. Excuse me. So basically from the article, Chandler says, I want to show Julian of Norwich within the rhetorical tradition, excuse me again, while she's still in the process of revising it. So she's, Chandler's trying to make us aware that 
uh, even if we want to take a revisionist stance toward rhetorical history, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So we need to adjust, yes, but keeping in mind both the history that's already extant and the new things or the things that have existed there that we haven't thought of. I just love this phrase that Chandler uses for Norwich's contributions to theology as speculative vernacular theology, because once you read Julian of Norwich's Divine Revelations of Love, you can see how they are speculative statements and also utilizing vernacular to communicate things that had been perhaps maybe rarefied ideas in really plain speech or plain writing as the case may be. But really, the Augustinian lens that Chandler's talking about is circles around to not just memory, but narrative as a tool for history and memory. Augustine emphasizes narrative and says it allows you to show past, present, and future, or as we might know from our second grade English language arts classes, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so that is part of what Julian of Norwich is both utilizing and kind of playing with. Oh, so there's just a lot here. It's cool and exciting to start talking about some of the things that we've already considered in our past readings and that now we're kind of a little further along the line. These ideas are being reinterpreted or deployed in ways that are kind of um, new and exciting in their own right. So that concludes this mini lesson. I'm going to pull back to my full view and we will close out this video. Okay, closing out this video with chat check-in number eight prompt. It's a would you rather election style. So the question is, would you rather not get any more texts related to voting from either side? Or would you rather not get any more like junk mail, mailer flyers? Which one and why? <laughs> All right, guys, have a great rest of your week. Don't hesitate to email me or set up a Zoom appointment if you need to. Otherwise, I will talk to you in next week's video. Bye, everybody.